Hello everyone, welcome to week two of our advanced webinar series, creating and using NDVI from satellite imagery. We apologize for the delay. We were having some issues with our um, Adobe Connect room, so um, we will hopefully get those sorted in the future and not have any issues with you all um, joining the room and attending. Um, however, the session will be recorded, so if anyone um, missed it, they will be able to um, pick back up with the recording. As a reminder, we have um, one lecture per week at 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern. You can find all of the course materials on the website listed. This includes past recordings, data links, and the homework exercises. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of each session. However, you can also email myself, Amber McCollum, or my colleague, Cindy Schmidt, at the email addresses listed below. Each week, we'll have a follow-on homework. There will be a link to the Google Form for submitting the homework in the course materials section of the RSET webinar website. In order to answer all of the homework questions, you need to complete the in-class exercise. To receive credit for homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline. Note that the deadline for week, week two homework is in two weeks on March 2nd. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all four live webinars and complete all four homework assignments. It takes some time to process the certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. As mentioned, you can access all the course materials here. Each week, you'll be able to find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish, any data necessary and the PDF of each week's in-class exercise, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and a link to the Google form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of who's, who is viewing them. Once you register, you'll automatically be taken to view the recording. On this week's agenda is deriving NDVI with Landsat using QGIS. To start off this week, we'll be reviewing Landsat bands and online web portals where you can access Landsat data. Remember, we reviewed one of these last week. Then we will complete our in-class exercise on how to derive NDVI from our Landsat imagery using QGIS. Remember, we'll use the same data set from last week's in-class exercise and homework. Finally, we will have about a 10-minute question and answer session, if there's time today. As a review, last week we discussed the specifics of NDVI. Remember, this is based on the relationship between red and near-infrared wavelengths. The applications for NDVR, NDVI are varied and can include understanding vegetation phenology, characterizing drought, and identifying vegetation health, just to name a few. NDVI anomalies are useful to understand the current state relative to the average state or normal land characteristics. For our in-class exercise, we introduced QGIS, showed you how to add vector and raster data, how to modify layer properties such as labels, and how to download Landsat imagery. As a quick review before we jump into our exercise, we will discuss the Landsat bands and the online data portals. This slide provides some information on the spectral characteristics of Landsat. Landsat was designed primarily to detect visible and infrared light that is reflected from the Earth's surface. The graphic on the right shows you that these data are collected in different bands, and these bands represent a range of wavelengths. For example, bands 1, 2, and 3 detect data from the visible light range. You can see in the graphic here that band 1 is primarily blue-green, but called blue. Band 2 is green-yellow, but called green, and band 3 is red. Band 4 is the near-infrared, and band 5 is the mid-infrared. Band 6 is the thermal band, and band 7 is another mid-infrared band. Then we have the panchromatic band, 
which is higher resolution band at 15 meters as opposed to the 30 meter multispectral band. This table provides each band, the wavelength range for each band, and the spatial resolution for each band for Landsat 4, 5, and 7. Remember, the spatial resolution refers to the size of each pixel represented in square meters on the Earth. The bands are all the same, with the exception of the thermal bands, which are a little coarser in resolution than the rest. Landsat 8, the sensor that was recently launched, is a little different and has some additional bands that were not available in Landsats 4 through 7. There is an additional band 1 that is the coastal aerosol band that is designed to focus on nearshore environments and to penetrate the water and to look at aerosol properties in the air. All the other bands are the same until you get to band 9, which is the cirrus band designed to look at clouds. Then there are two thermal bands, bands 10 and 11. The thermal bands are collected at 100 meters but resampled to 30 meters to match the rest of the bands. This figure shows the difference in band coverage between the Landsat 7 and 8 sensors. It also provides information about the atmospheric window that allows the sensors to obtain data in those spectral ranges. These windows represent the wavelengths at which the electromagnetic radiation will penetrate the Earth's atmosphere and can thus be observed by our sensors. Notice that while the bandwidths are similar for the two Landsat sensors, they are not identical. Therefore, it is important to understand these differences when applying the same processes to images from two different sensors. This table summarizes the differences in band numbers between Landsat 8 and the other Landsat sensors. The red and near-infrared bands, which are the ones that are important for NDVI, are bands 4 and 5 for Landsat 8, and bands 3 and 4 for Landsat 4, 5, and 7. It's important to know this when calculating NDVI using the geospatial software that we'll see in this exercise today. It's also useful to understand the Landsat naming convention outlined here. The first letter is the satellite type, indicated with an L for Landsat. The second is the instrument type. In this example, it's a combined optical and thermal product. You could also obtain the OLI that contains all of the visual and near infrared, infrared bands, or the thermal imager, which just contains the thermal bands. Next is the Landsat number. Here it's eight, or it could be five or seven, depending on which Landsat satellite you're using. Next is the path number, and then the row number. The path and row refer to the Worldwide, Worldwide Reference System, or WRS, which is a global notation system for Landsat data. The paths are specified by sequential path numbers from east to west of the nominal satellite orbit tracks. The row refers to the latitudinal center of each scene. Next is the year with which the scene was acquired, and then the Julian day, which is something often used by NASA um, in NASA data. You can find the conversion using a simple Google search or within the exercise for today. There's a Julian calendar. Next is the ground station where the data were received. Then you have the archive number. In our scenes, you will obtain multiple .tiff images that are each band separately. So if you download the data in this manner, you will also see the band number at the end of the Landsat name. You can obtain Landsat images from many different sources. The Landsat Look Viewer, Globus, the Land Cover Facility, and Earth Explorer. I last week, we showed you how to download Landsat imagery from Glovis, and I encourage you to try some of these other websites. You can also obtain data from the web-enabled Landsat Data Portal, Portal, or WELD, that provides Landsat data for 2003 to 2012 for the continental U.S. and Alaska. And globally, for 2009, 2010, and 2011. The well data are terrain corrected and radiometrically calibrated, so users don't have to convert the Landsat digital numbers to reflectance. 
the USGS has also been working on the Landsat Global Archive Consolidation. And this figure on the right shows you where there are more in red or less in blue Landsat data available on a global scale for the duration of Landsat's lifetime. Finally, the Global Land Survey is not a data portal, but the global collection of cloud-free Landsat images from 1975 to 2008. There are also time series available from 1975, 1990, 2000, 2005, and 2010 that are useful primarily for change detection. These data products can be acquired through some of the data portals mentioned previously. Okay, now we will switch gears and do our in-class exercise on calculating NDVI using Landsat. So I will now um, hand the floor over to Cindy Schmitz. And if you just uh, bear with us for a moment, we're going to share. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, Amber, can you see the screen? Okay, can everybody see um, the QGIS screen also? Can you just let me know? Okay. I got a bunch of yeses, so that's good. All right, everyone, so I am going to show you how to calculate NDVI using satellite imagery and then using the software QGIS that we talked about last week. Uh, but before we get started, I want to remind you, and Amber said this as well, that you need to have the Landsat imagery um, downloaded. And this is the Landsat at 8 image that we talked about last week. Uh, so it's path 43, row 33, and the date on it is September 22, 2015. And you will also need to download the shape file that we have. We're going to be using it to clip out some of the imagery called calaveras.shape. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that. So first of all, you need to uh, open QGIS, which you can see I have here. And the first thing we're going to need to do is put all the bands that we're interested in from Landsat into one file. So we will go to Raster, Miscellaneous, Merge. And the input files are going to be band one through six of the Landsat imagery. So as you can see here, I have all the bands of Landsat 8, but we're only going to be selecting six. We're actually not even going to need all six. But this will allow us different options for viewing the Landsat imagery. So I'm going to select those six bands, and I'm going to click Open. And then we need to give this file a name. So I'm going to open this back up and put it in the same folder, and I'm going to call it Landsat underscore merge. You can give it any name you, that you want. And as you can see down here, that there's a uh, that this will be a TIFF file. So then you put save, and you'll see it showing up in the output file here. The next thing you want to do is make sure you click Layer Stack On, as I'm showing here and then click OK. And we'll wait a few minutes and it will create a new file. And there it is. So we just click everything off here and we close it and you can see a Landsat imagery has appeared. So as you can see from this Landsat image, the color is probably not exactly what you would like. So we're gonna change that color. So in order to do that, you go up to the Layers panel here on the, on the left-hand side, right-click on the name of the image, and go to Properties. So 
the properties went to a different there it is so the properties allows you to look at all kinds of different things in the image in the imagery and in this case what we want to do is change the colors that we're seeing on the image and so we want to go to something called style so if you run your um, mouse over the left hand icons over here you will see there's general there's style transparency pyramids histogram and metadata so we will leave it on style right now and within style there's several different sections there's band rendering there's color rendering there's resampling and if you scroll down all the way you'll see a thumbnail as well so in order to change the color on this landsat imagery you need to make sure the render type is called multiband color which it is right now and then we need to choose which landsat 8 bands will go into the red green and blue bands which is designated right here. There are many options for this, and we're not going to go into it uh, too much right now, but for now, we're going to put the mid-infrared Landsat band, which is band 6, into the red band. We'll put the near-infrared Landsat band, which is band 5, into the green band. And the green Landsat band, which is band 3, will leave in the blue band, so it looks like this. The next thing you need to do is come over here to the right and click Load. We're going to leave everything else the same, and then if you scroll down and click on Apply, you will actually see the color change in the thumbnail, and then you'll also see the color change on the image. So click OK. So now we have an image that looks much more like an image. However, the color isn't really very bright. It's sort of a dull color. Um, and although we can still see, we can see vegetation is green, uh, which is all the green here. The lake in the middle is, you know, dark blue. And then everything else is sort of the pinks and purples. But we're going to brighten it up a little bit. So in order to do that, you need to zoom into an area in the image. So I'm going to click the zoom tool that I have right here and zoom into an area and try not to include any of the black outside area. The reason why the color is a little dull is because it's actually including the background values in the color stretch. So I'm going to move it so we don't have any black area, which is sometimes a little hard. There we go. Something like that. There's a little bit of black, but that's okay. So then we're going to go back to the Landsat Merge. We're going to right click on Properties, bring up the style again, leave everything else the same that we did before. So we have band 6, band 5, and band 3 showing. But now what we're going to do is under Extent here, we're going to click Current rather than Full, and then Load again and then click OK at the bottom. And you can see instantly that the color is much, much brighter. So let's zoom out to the whole image again. And now it looks much better. So let's take a look at this image a little bit, and I'll try to interpret it for you so you know what you're looking at. This is actually all the green area here is the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California. The lake in the middle that you see here is Lake Tahoe. On the far left-hand side, which is uh, to the west of the Sierra Nevada mountains, are, is a valley area. So there's a lot of grass and shrubs and things like that. Um, this is a summer, late summer image, and so a lot of the grass in California is brown, which is why you see a lot of this brown color on the lower left-hand side. And the little green areas that you see just past the brown areas is, as, is agriculture. On the right-hand side is a lot of um, rock uh, areas, high elevation, that don't have a lot of vegetation on it, so that's why you don't see a lot of green um, to the east of Lake Tahoe. Now, there are some very prominent features in this image that you may wonder what they are. So you see some, some areas, some brown areas right here, right here, and down here. And those are actually fire scars that have occurred in the Sierra Nevada over the past several, several years. 
And as a matter of fact, this fire scar in the bottom of the image just occurred shortly after this, um, or shortly before this image was acquired. So this image, is, this fire is a 2015 fire. So for the next part of the exercise, rather than calculating NDVI for the whole area, we're going to be calculating NDVI for a much smaller area within this image. Um, one, just to save time, but also to show you how to clip an image to a vector area that you might have. So what we're going to do is display the vector file by clicking on the upper left the Add Vector Layer icon. So we'll click that, and this is where we're going to use our calaveras.shape file. So next to data set, we'll click Browse, and I have a Calaveras shape file already here, as you can see. I'll click on that, click Open, and then clip, click Open again. Now, you would think that the shape file would actually show up on the image. Well, there's a reason why it doesn't. Uh, because the Calaveras shapefile and the Landsat imagery are in two different projection systems. And this will happen a lot when you work with geospatial data, where you will get data from two different projections. The nice thing about this software and many software packages is that it will display imagery in two different projections on the fly. But for QGIS, you need to specify that you want that image on the fly, that projection on the fly. So in, there are several ways you can do this, but I'm going to show you one way. So if you look in the lower right-hand corner of the display area, you will see something that says EPSG colon 32610. So click on that, and another box will show up. And in that box, on the top of this box, you will see Enable On The Fly CRS Transformation. You want to click that on. And then once you click that on, and you click OK, well, wait a second, you will see that vector file overlay onto your image. So at this point, we want to, this vector file is actually a county boundary, so the states in the United States are divided into smaller political areas called counties. And Calaveras is a county within the state of California that is halfway in the mountains and halfway out of the mountains. And as you can see, it actually partially goes off this particular image, but that's OK. So the next thing we want to do is clip the Landsat image to this vector file. So we'll go to Raster. Extraction, Clipper. So you can see the Clipper dialog box comes up. So as you can see, the input file, the raster file, the Landsat merge image is already in there since that's the only raster image that's, that you're displaying right now. So now you want to give it an output file name. So we'll have it go in the same area as all the images, and we'll just call it Calaveras, the same as the county. And it will also be a GeoTIFF file, so you can leave that the same, and you say Save. So you can see that name shows up in the output file. The other thing you want to do is click the No Data Value as zero. And the most important thing here is under Clipping Mode, rather than extent, so, so you can actually specify an extent if you know the coordinates of the area that you're interested in. But since we're using a vector file, we want to click on Mask Layer. And the mask layer is our Calaveras vector file, our shape file, which is already there. So it's already set um, as a mask layer, so we don't have to select anything new. And then, of course, we want to have Load into Canvas when finished clicked on. So then click OK, and it'll take just a few seconds here, very few seconds, and our processing is complete. So then we close everything up, 
and now you see something that looks really odd but we'll start closing things down so what we'll do is we'll close the larger Landsat merge image we'll close the Calaveras boundary and we're left with the clipped image so let's zoom into that a little bit and now you can see it and as again um, the colors are really funny so we'll want to change those colors again in this image, the same as we did with the Landsat Merge image. We'll right-click on Calaveras, go to Properties, leave it on Style, and again, we want to use the same band combination. So in the red band, we want to put band 6. In the green band, we want to put band 5. And in the blue band, we can leave band 3. Leave everything else the same and then click load. And you can see the min max numbers change when you click load. And at this point, you can just click OK. And there you see we have a beautiful image where the vegetation is green um, and the non vegetation is sort of a, a pink uh, gray color. Again, I want to point out some features in this image. Um, we have the mountain areas here on the right hand side which is green so these are higher elevation areas we have the fire scar that just occurred in September 2015 very very new fire scar here in the middle which is all purple and on the left hand side we have lower elevation so we're getting out of the mountains and we have grasses and uh, lower elevation vegetation also you can see a few water bodies here you can see a reservoir um, and a few more water bodies right on the edge of the county boundary so at this point we can create an ndvi image so to make this ndvi image as we mentioned before we're going to be using the red band and the near infrared band so the red band for landsat 8 is band 4 and the near infrared band for Landsat 8 is band 5. So in order to do that, we're going to go to raster, raster calculator. We're going to do this through a calculator, so it's going to be manual. Um, I do want to make a comment here that if you do have other image processing software packages or other GIS packages, oftentimes there's a button that you can click that will just automatically create an NDVI image for you. Um, in this case, I wanted to do it manually so you understand exactly what the formula is uh, to create this image. So raster calculator in QGIS is very powerful and allows you to do a lot of different kinds of mathematical operations. So if you read your lab exercise and you look at some of the other material that we gave you, you know that the NDV NDVI formula is the near infrared minus the red band divided by the near infrared plus the red band. So we're going to put that into our raster calculator right now. So your formula will be Calaveras 5, so you double click on the images and Calaveras is the image that we're doing right now so it's a smaller image um, and the formula here is Calaveras at 5 means that's band 5 for Calaveras so we're doing Calaveras band 5 minus band 4 divided by band 5 plus band 4 now the one thing you want to be careful with um, in doing these raster calculator expressions is you want to make sure that your parentheses are uh, in place. So we're going to do that right now. We'll put parentheses around the top equation and parentheses around the bottom equation. So this is what your equation should look like whenever you do any kind of NDVI calculation you have to figure out for any image whether that's Landsat or MODIS or whether it's AVHRR uh, or even some of the high resolution imagery what is the red band and what is the near infrared band and then you can put this exact same formula in there so we'll need to give this new output layer a name so we will call this Calaveras underscore NDVI
and we leave everything else the same. Uh, you can actually specify the extent if you want. We want to add the result to the project. The, the reference system stays the same, and we just click OK. And we wait a minute, and then there's the NDVI image. On the left-hand side, you can see the Calaveras underscore NDVI image shows up. And you can also see the minimum and maximum values uh, that show up on the screen as well. So as you notice, this image is in black and white. The, so generally, the lighter the color, the higher the NDVI value. The darker the color, the lower the NDVI value. As you re can recall, NDVI values range from minus 1 to 1, with 0 between minus 1 and 0 having no vegetation, and from 0 to 1, well, one having the highest density of vegetation. So generally, though, it's harder to interpret NDVI as black and white. So generally, we like to view NDVI images with a color ramp ranging from red, which is usually the low NDVI values, to green, which is the high NDVI values. So we're going to do that right now. So you right click again on the image name on the left hand side and go to properties. And we'll stay in style. So the render type right now says single band gray. We want to change that to single band pseudo color. And when you do that, you see a whole lot of new options pop up. We want to, right now, the first option that pops up is the red, yellow, green color ramp option. So we want to keep that option. Then We'll keep everything else the same. We'll keep the mode as continuous, etc. Then we'll click Classify. And when you click Classify on the left-hand side, you can see the color ramp show up and then the values that go with each of those colors. Now, you can change those around a little bit, but for now, we're just going to keep it as is. So click OK. And you can see those colors change from the black and white to the colors. Now let's take a look again at this image to see what's going on. On the right hand side where you see all the green, as we mentioned before, is where all the vegetation is. So we have higher NDVI values where there's vegetation. On the left hand side with the lower elevations and there's less vegetation, you have less green. And the fire scar where there's been, um, the vegetation has been burned away, we have red. Now, Unusually, we also have all the water bodies as red because, of course, there's no vegetation there. So we can actually change it so those water bodies are blue. So in order to do that, we're going to go back to the properties of Calaveras NDVI. And we're going to take a look at this color ramp again, and we're going to add a color. So we'll click on this little plus right there, which adds a value 0. And then when you sort the items, so this triangle pointing down is called sort color map items. If you click on that, it'll move that 0 up to where it belongs in the color map list. So right now, everything, every value that 0 or below is going to be this pink color. So we know that the water is 0 or below, but we want to make that blue. So you can double click on that, and a color ramp will come up. So just click anywhere in the blue areas on the color ramp, like that. Doesn't matter what color blue that you choose for the water, whatever you prefer. Then click OK. And then if you look again, you'll see that 0 value will now be blue. You'll click, click classify. Oops, you don't click classify again. So let's just go through it again. Sorry, that's my fault. Let's bring it up, double click, click the blue, click OK, and then click OK. So as you can see now in the image, the water is now blue. All the water bodies here, so these are reservoirs uh, in the lower elevations in these areas. You can also see that there's some blue now in the fire scars, and that's just because those areas 
are very, very dark due to the fire. So they're showing up spectrally for NDVI the same as the water. It doesn't mean that they're water actually, but it does mean that there's no vegetation in those areas at all. So in order to get some more information about the NDVI values for this area, you can click on the image again, go to properties, and then click on metadata. And if you click on metadata, you'll see various things available. There's not a lot filled in right now for metadata under description and so forth. That's all stuff you can fill in if you like. What we're interested in is the properties. So if you go down to properties here and you scroll down a little bit, you'll get all kinds of information about this data set, including the statistics. So if you're doing something like looking at NDVI values, uh, over time, you're looking at trends and you're trying to get an average of an area. This is the way you can get that information. So you can get the mean NDVI for this area by looking at the properties here. And in this case, that mean NDVI is around 0.22. And if you're trying to look at how that changes over time, then you could run the same process over many different areas or over a lot of different times to get the chain and then plot out the means. So we'll be doing a lot of that next week with MODIS data and looking at um, NDVI time series. So I'm just going to close this. And in closing, so this is how you do NDVI with Landsat imagery. As you can see, NDVI images show you a range of greenness in an image, but it will not tell you how much biomass or percent cover vegetation there is in the image. And that's important to know. So this just gives you relative greenness within an image. In order to get any biophysical measurements, you have to do field work to determine the re relationship between those biophysical measurements on the ground and the NDVI values. Also, it's important to know that NDVI values saturate at very high biomass levels, so it's difficult to use NDVI in those regions. I'll note, and we'll discuss this more next week, but the MODIS sensor has dealt with some of those saturation issues by using an EVI uh, calculation rather than NDVI. It is, however, NDVI a good indicator of relative biomass, and it's very useful for looking at changes in biomass over time due to drought, insects, disease, or other vegetation conditions. Next week, we'll be showing you how to look at NDVI time series in the next couple of sessions. So with that, we have some time to answer some questions, if you have any. Um, and again, we apologize for our delay in starting this week. Hopefully, we won't run into those same issues next week. Uh, but if we do, just hang tight, and we'll get we'll get the room open up uh, eventually next week as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to any questions, and I want to thank everybody for listening. Amber, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to you. So I see there's a question about EVI. EVI is the Enhanced Vegetation Index, uh, and it's only used right now for MODIS because it has a, a different kind of uh, equation than NDVI does. So we'll be talking a little bit about EVI next week. So there's a question about shadows influencing NDVI. Shadows always influence almost everything in satellite imagery, unfortunately. So oftentimes what will happen is you'll see NDVI values darker in shadow areas. 
uh, you can sometimes deal with that with a, a DEM. So there's a question if we are going to use another application like ERDAS or NV, the same question will be used. So yes, if you are using something like ERDAS or NV, which are both image processing software packages, they are not open source, by the way. So we're using QGIS, which is open source. You use the same equation, but both of those software packages also have a button that you can just click for your imagery for, for a particular sensor. So say for Landsat 5 and 7, you can click a button and it will automatically create an NDVI image. But they all also have options for doing raster calculators. So you can do it either way. So somebody asked if there's any difference using ERDAS and QGIS software for NDVI. Your result will not be the same. The result will be the same. The process is sometimes a little bit different. But again, you use the same equation if you're using raster calculator in ERDAS or QGIS. The, ra the, the equation is the same and your result will be the same. Does QGIS have any batch processing capability? Yes, it does have batch processing capability. We're just starting to get into using that ourselves. So unfortunately, I can't give you instruction on that right now, but it, it does. The nice thing about QGIS is that you can write your own code to do things, and there already is some code existing to do batch. Somebody asked, can I use the same procedure in QGIS with images from another source? Yes, you can. So the important thing to know, if you are using images from another source, what are what is the red band and what is the near infrared band? So of course, the bands are going to be different numbers depending on the image that you use. So as long as you know what bands are the red band and which bands are the are the near infrared bands, then you can use the exact same calculation for any image. So there's a question about the difference between NDVI and EVI. We're not going to go into that with these sessions, primarily because we're focusing on NDVI. And we went into that with our previous sessions. So our prerequisites for this course is that you listen to our two intro sessions. And in one of those intro sessions, we already go into the difference between NDVI and EVI. We may touch on it again next week, but we're not going to go into any great detail on that. So there's a question about when are the NDVI values negative and why were there only positive values in this exercise? Mostly, you won't get a lot of negative NDVI values. Sometimes you will. Actually, what I'm going to do is go, if you go into the properties on this image and you can't see my screen right now, oh, we're turning it over here. Let me show you. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen right now. So I'm in the properties of the NDVI image at the moment. And if you scroll down to see the minimum and the mean and the maximum, you will notice that the minimum is actually a negative value. So what happens is when you you bin when you make an NDVI image a color, it will group automatically group the values for you. You can change that if you want. You can go in and manually change that. But the software, and this is all software will do this. And if you only specify five or six bins, 
it will group those values for you. So all the negative values in this case got grouped with, with that blue color, which was zero or below, but the actual minimum is a negative value. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, I'm going to stop sharing again, Amber. So there's a question about dealing with clouds. That's a really good question, actually. And it's always a problem with satellite imagery dealing with clouds. So most of the time what we end up doing is, is cutting those clouds right out of the image. And there are some cloud masks you can use to take the clouds out. Sometimes if you have imagery that's close enough in date to your current image, you can fill in those cloud areas with other imagery. But most of the time, it's just data that's, that's gone. There's not a whole lot you can do with dealing with clouds in your imagery. So if you live in an area that is high cloud prone, then it is problematic with Landsat imagery oftentimes. The MODIS imagery, which is coarser in spatial resolution, the, the products are actually averages over a period of time, eight day or 16 day um, period. And the reason is to get rid of some of those cloud issues. So if you use a coarser image, sometimes you can deal with clouds. But Landsat, it, it is a problem. Yeah, so there's a, a statement here that Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 have different band numbers to designate red and infrared, but I'm sure the results will be the same. That's exactly correct. So it's important to know for Landsat 7, which is why we mentioned that before, so 5 and 7 have different band numbers than Landsat 8. So again, if you're using NDVI on 5 or 7, the band numbers are going to be different than what we used in this exercise. So the important thing to know is what band is the red and what band is the near infrared. So there's a question, NDVI from Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 will be different because the sensors are different. Yeah, they're a little bit different. Is it okay to do a time series analysis? So it's important to understand that they are a little bit different. However, when you do an NDVI, it's a ratio between two bands. So you're looking at relative greenness. It would be interesting to actually compare an NDVI from Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 since the bandwidths are, are slightly different. My guess is there's not going to be a lot of difference between the two. Again, because you're looking at relative greenness, so you're looking at ratios. Uh, but I'm not sure if anybody has looked at that yet. I, I, I'm guessing, though, there won't be that much difference between the two. Oh, here's a, it's a good question, actually. Does NDVI need radiance reflectance? So do you need to do uh, radiometric or atmospheric correction on NDVI imagery? That's a, it's a great question. So here, here's my answer. You can do, you can do radiometric correction on the imagery. Uh, and actually, you can even get some Landsat now that's already been, uh, radiometrically and atmospherically corrected. However, again, because NDVI is a ratio of the bands, you're looking at the relative difference between the red and the NDVI and the near infrared values to get to NV NDVI. Oftentimes, because you're looking at that ratio, you don't necessarily need to do the atmospheric correction. Um, because if you do an atmospheric correction, or radiometric correction on your imagery, that ratio will be the same or similar anyway, no matter what you do to that imagery. So, so most of the time, the nice thing about NDVI is that you kind of deal with that atmospheric correction, radiometric correction, simply by doing the ratio.
So somebody just put in the chat the the difference in the equations between Landsat 8 and Landsat 4, 5, and 7. Thanks, that's great. So it's the Bandsat, the Bands 5 and 4 for Landsat 8 and Bands 4 and 3 for Landsat 4, 5, and 7. Okay, so here's a question about Landsat 7 images. Is it best to avoid Landsat 7 images after the scanline corrector malfunctioned in 2003? Yes, so the scanline corrector malfunction is a big deal for Landsat 7 because you're missing imagery, essentially. You have stripes through your image, uh, and that's as long as you know that going into using the Landsat imagery, then you can use Landsat 7 images. However, you can't get that imagery back. That that image, those stripes are gone. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I would say yes, it's best to avoid Landsat 7 images if you can, just because of that missing data. If you can use 5 um, and now 8 to do what you need to do, I would highly recommend that. Yeah, somebody mentioned that the NIR may be affected differently by atmosphere than uh, red. Therefore, the ratio may not exactly be the same as using uncorrected bands. That is very true. Uh, but I think the difference won't be as big. So I, my answer again to the atmosphere correction is if you can do it, do it. It's always best to do the atmospheric radiometric correction. If you can't do it or if you don't have time to do it, then your results of your NDVI image will be fairly similar to is to if you did do the correction. Amber just listed the website where you can get all the materials. The exercise that we went through today is on there. The Calaveras shapefile is on there as well. Again, you will have to download your own Landsat image. If you'd like to use your own image to do this, you're welcome to do that as well. All right, everyone. So it looks like uh, we're at 10 o'clock now. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you have further questions, you can email myself or Cynthia. And next week, we will be talking about MODIS NDVI time series. So thanks again for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to talking with you all next week.